Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this really fantastic discussion. Uh, my name is Michelle Maloney. I'm the um, co-founder and national convener of the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, or AILA, and I'm also one of the directors um, and founders of the New Economy Network Australia, NINA. And today I'm really pleased, uh, we're really kicking off our Earth Economics Week, uh, which is part of AILA's Earth Laws Month. And today we've got our wonderful um, speaker, Dr. Mary Graham, who I'll introduce in just a moment. But first, I would like to acknowledge country. And it's become quite a Zoom tradition for folks to acknowledge country and write in uh, the Zoom chat where you are and where you're from today. It's always lovely to read those comments. I am lucky to live, work and play on the beautiful lands of the Kabi Kabi and Jinnabara peoples in what is now Narangbar, which is part of Southeast Queensland. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this beautiful land. Their land was never ceded. Um, they are the custodians and always have been and always will be the, the keepers of place and the carers for country. I'd like to acknowledge the governance system of the uh, uh, Indigenous peoples across this continent and how I'm in deep admiration um, of the systems that they set in place which Mary will speak about shortly, that have looked after every pocket of the ecosystem and persons across this beautiful land of ours. I'd also like to acknowledge my kind of commitment personally to these big ideas around decolonizing and rethinking our place, not just in Australia, but in the wider world. So the work that AILA does, the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, is very much inviting people, particularly from Western industrialized societies, to rethink who we think we are, what our um, ongoing systems look like for economics, law, education, even the knowledge systems, the things we think we know. AILA is all about shifting from um, human-centered extractivist ways of being to earth-centered and much more relationist and regenerative ways of being. So if you don't know about AILA, please look us up. Um, we're a small but nimble little group doing lots of interesting and thought-provoking work. And I'm just going to quickly share screen to promote what Nina is up to this week and invite men many of you, if you don't already know, uh, to please join us for some of those activities. So I've got it up here on the website somewhere. Buttons never work when you want them to. There they are. So as part of um, Earth Laws Month, which you can find some beautiful events happening across September, and I won't read them out, but there's some terrific events um, throughout this whole month. But part of that lineup is also this Earth Economics Week so today, um, to kick things off for our Earth Economics Week, Mary Graham will share with us insights into Indigenous philosophy and the relationist ethos and apply that in her thinking to uh, reflect on some aspects of our economic system. Tonight, we've got our degrowth legends, Anitra Nelson and Terry Leahy. They're on at 6pm because Anitra's in Europe. Tomorrow night, we have a very special guest, um, Daniel Christian Vahl, who's known for his work on designing regenerative cultures. Um, he'll be joining us. He's in Spain, so it's another evening session. And I won't read them all out, but we've got a fantastic webinar on Thursday lunchtime with Mark Diesendorf and Rod Taylor about their new book. And we're going to have a really excellent conversation with Bob Costanza, um, one of the guys who's been involved in um, building the field of work known as ecological economics. So if you're interested in all of those things, please do visit the website and um, have a look and log in. The only other thing I want to plug is that the wonderful Mary Graham will be joining us via Zoom at the NINA conference. Our, I like to call it our economics extravaganza or our grassroots fiesta anything to make economics sound more appealing and exciting to those of us who um, want to change the system. But our conference is called Life After Capitalism, and I'm really delighted we're going to have an in-person conference in Canberra, 17th to the 19th of November. Really reasonable um, prices, and there'll be lots of ways to help everyone carpool, share accommodation, and have a good time. And Mary Graham and Yin Paradis will be our keynote speakers on day one, via Zoom, sharing insights into life before and after capitalism, meaning all the other cultures and systems that have existed. So that should be a really fantastic way to kick off the first in-person conference we have had for many, many years, thanks to uh, Father COVID. All right, that's about all I had to say, but I'm really looking forward to um, introducing Mary Graham. So Mary will talk for about 20 or 30 minutes and we'll still have time for some questions. 
Um, and Mary, thank you so much for being with us again. We rope you into so much speaking to share with people some of your amazing work. So thank you. Oh, and you're on mute. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, uh, I'll introduce myself, Mary Graham. I was born in Brisbane, grew up here on the Gold Coast in Southport, from my father's people's area here, the uh, Yugambe language speaking people here. Uh, Komba Mary is the actual group I'm with. My mother is Waka Waka from uh, three, four hundred kilometres northwest of here on a reserve called Sherberg um, under the Act, under the Queensland Act. Um, my father wasn't under that Act, no. um, the Aboriginal Protection Act. Um, it's a longer term than that longer name. But I was, uh, so I've got relatives all around South East Queensland, really, basically. And um, so I acknowledge my own ancestors too uh, here and the ancestors uh, uh, and traditional um, custodians of people wherever you are, you are all uh, listening in uh, from. Um, uh, the very first thing I should say is I, I'm not an economist. <gasps> I know very little about economics, um, but I do, um, I do, um, you know, very um, close to our own ways of thinking um, and being in our own country, uh, all over the whole country. Um, so I guess I'll start off also by saying that um, the essential uh, relationless connection we have with each other via land um, is is to do with a recipro reciprocity, a reciprocal um, system. You could you could call it in one line um, a sacralized ecological collaborative stewardship system. So and it comes from the idea that land land has invented us. It's grown us up just like every other life form. Uh, that we that you see around us. So we come out of the ground, out of the earth. Uh, in in that sense, it's not unlike science. So we we, we would agree with science uh, that we do come from uh, you know the Maya uh, actually and developed over millions of years and so on and so on. The only big difference is that uh, Aboriginal people, like many Indigenous everywhere, uh, would say we it's a sacralized system. It's not just a pure physical objective system. It's a sacralized system. It's made sacred, that whole progress, uh, 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 the whole um, developmental stage and, and so on. So um, the relationless connection is land has invented us. We're obliged forever to look after it. So that's why it's reciprocal. And the connection uh, when you look at, if you've ever seen a language map, Aboriginal language map, what you're really looking at is language language groups for sure, but you're also looking at a governance system. Uh, so it's, as you know, and it has been proved quite easily, um, it's an ancient, it's very ancient. People have been in, in these areas for conservatively around about 60 to 65, 70,000 years and so on. Um, and every square inch of the country is somebody's responsibility. There's no such thing as empty land, nobody's land, or wild land, or anything like that. So you have a, a system, uh, a governance system, where uh, you, we are supposed to look after the place we have, we do. Uh, plus, it's um, a, a flat society, fl uh, uh, sorry, system, governance system, no hierarchy. And that's a big thing, just simply for our economics straight off. No hierarchy, no rulers, no ruled, no command, obedience system, no class system, no caste system, nothing. Nobody gets treated any better than other people. However, uh, so it's a, a flat system, as in uh, um, poli political theory, it's a heterarchy, or lateral, if you want to just say lateral. Um, so uh, no... Um, uh, system where uh, some people uh, receive a lot, uh, as in um, food, uh, care, and so on and so on, and others don't receive so much. Um, it's a sharing, uh, but very, um, it's a very uh, uh, equal, you could say equal system, um, where that's how you have to 
actually be with each other. We are autonomous, out of this relational connect, connection, we're autonomous beings. So autonomous regard is the system that we have to have with each other. So autonomy, balance, uh, gender balance, uh, governance, balance between the notions of uh, authority and power. Authority is in the hands of older people. Power is in the hands of the people in general. The old, old idea of power to the people. Well, this is an ancient system that actually put that into practice, actually. So um, there's no unfair system, unequal system, anything like that. Straight away, that tells you our uh, idea about what economics could be or should be, really. The other one is, bal um, sorry, place. Um, the old, uh, uh, oh, what's his name, uh, Deka, um, you know, I think therefore I am. Everyone's familiar with that saying, even if they might not be with that philosopher. I think therefore I am. Um, our equivalent would be, I am located, therefore I am. So your whole life in the old system, the old system says that you are bound up with uh, caring for your own place. You have a logic that follows that too. Um, but before I get onto that, it's ethics. There is an ethical system. It's just not called ethics. It's actually called the law, L-A-W-L-O-R-E. So people have to, one is, uh, sorry, L-A-W is the rules. The L-O-R-E are all the stories about the, how those rules came about, actually. And everybody has this kind of, uh, across the country, law, Aboriginal law, L-A-W and L-O-R-E. Um, so... Uh, the logic that follows that is not at all anything like, um, um, uh, sorry, uh, Greek logic. It's not anything like um, Aristotle, Aristotle log Aristotelian logic. Our logic, again, you have to look at that map. Um, so every different, all the hundreds of places, each place has got its own dreaming story or several dreaming stories, uh, a creative narrative, you can call it, or even a, a genesis. Um, so they're there. Um, so a dreaming story is the law for that place, those two laws. Both sides are the same coin of existence, really. That's what those laws are. Uh, so everybody has their own law. Um, uh, there's the truth. A law is a truth for that place. The truth emanates from a particular locality and land. Truth about anything and everything, actually. Um, that is the uh, setup, the uh, structure, their structure. So they're not clones of each other. There are different um, ways of being, cultural rules and, and so on in every, every place. Uh, and then finally, um, we have our own um, perspective on life. So the, the logic is all perspectives are valid and reasonable. Now, again, that's a kind of a marker, I would say, against um, the very notion of economics, um, economics as in um, competitiveness and so on. So no competitiveness. It's not seen as a, a great, wonderful thing. Um, the, the great, wonderful thing is, um, uh, um, sorry, um, I'm sorry, I forget that word. <laughs> this is what it comes of getting older. You forget certain words. Um, the idea of managing, that's right. You manage resources. You don't compete over resources. Now, you, you may or may not, um, you may or may not um, like your neighbour, which is perfectly acceptable. That's quite okay. Uh, but you have to be aware of, of their perspectives, their interests in life and so on. And this is autonomous regard, autonomous regard. You don't take advantage of anybody else um, uh, at their expense. And again, that goes against, um, I think, uh, certain aspects of economics. Um, so they wouldn't be economical in that way if you're doing down, um, you know, doing damage to your neighbours or anybody else. But also it's a, it's a generally um, well, uh, well thought through um, system for stability. Um, stability is far more important than peace. Peace, are mo there are moments of peace. They come and they go and so on and so on. Um, and peace after a fight and so on, that, that's a good thing. But uh, um, um, s stability is the thing that everybody aims for. So you have a system, um, cultural, economic, like as in looking after resources, 
um, making sure you don't um, are cruel or exploitative, overly exploitative of resources where you are. And the other thing too, though, is if people in some areas are having a hard time of it, I don't know, maybe there's a flood there or, or something else or very, um, uh, the weather, you know, the climate has changed and so on. You're obliged to look out for each other. You're obliged to, um, even if you hadn't looked, hadn't got on before, you're obliged to look after people and not leave people to their own um, resources, you know, their own um, difficult times and, and so on. So it's just very, very uh, different. Um, the the one thing I have to say is that although I'm not, n never was a communist or Marxist, the one thing I liked about Marx was um, the idea of his saying about philosophy, that philosophy is very important. It's very good, very interesting and cl clever and all that. It's got a lot of good things about it. But the really important thing about it is that you have to be able to change a system. You have to be able to change the system if it's cruel or if it's exploitative and, and so on and so on. That's the real worth of having the right um, philosophy in that way. Uh, one philosopher I must must mention and really, really urge people to read him, you might be already familiar with him, is Michael Hudson, a brilliant, uh, uh, brilliant um, American uh, economist. I, why I like him, part of the many reasons why I like him, is um, that he he looks at ancient um, uh, civilizations. For example, just one thing he talks about, yeah, forgive us our debt, uh, not forgive, forgive us our sins, which when you really think about it, um, doesn't make sense actually, um, but forgive us our debts. Yes, that is exactly what used to happen in these ancient societies. Debts were wiped out, uh, what do you call it? Made it clean, um, cleaned, oh, there's another word for it. Anyway, they were uh, forgiven. Um, this is way, way back. It allowed for a certain amount or a great amount of stability that a society, even if it's having, say, I don't know, difficulties with their neighbours, uh, another sort of, um, you know, next door neighbours, um, it, it, it makes for a, a certain amount of um, stability. Uh, but um, just practically, it uh, prevents uh, your own population from rebelling <laughs> and and taking it out on you. You know the rulers of the time. You know they had they did have rulers and ruled. You know, but they had clever some of, some of those ancient places. What he talks about how it worked, and he he talks about how it's absolutely a key thing to have now to forgive debts. Uh, and I don't know if he's talking about all debts because this is where I don't fully you know, understand the whole idea of economics and so on. But it sounds like a very fair system, you know, very fair. And probably in the end, uh, that's what Aboriginal people would um, really, really like. And it's not as if uh, the West can't do it or not does it, but deliberately doesn't do it but or can't do it. When I think about um, one of the wonderful old um, uh, policies of the British uh, Prime Minister, Bevan and Neuron, I think, in the 19, after the Second World War anyway, they brought in the National Health Service. The National Health Service is a brilliant old style, very Aboriginal style, actually way of looking after the everybody. So a National Health Service is a health service that is a very good quality health care for everybody and it's free. It's just got to be free for so poor people don't miss out. Uh, very people who have bad health from all kinds of the kind of work they be, they do or did or do, um, they're, they're looked after by that system. That is of good government, good governance, I should say, but good government who did that, <laughs> uh, good governance. And, um, and that all fits in to look after the population to um, uh, live their life, have jobs, be whatever they want to be, and so on and so on. Now that's good economics, but good so social um, social um, well-being, I guess you could say, you know. So there's all, uh, and that follows. If we didn't know anything about it, Aboriginal people would say, ah, that's stewardship. That's what we would call custodian, the custodial ethos of looking after not only the land, but looking after people. And that's the other beauty about looking after land is that it's like uh, you're training on the job to be a steward. So you're looking after land 
and you do that for a few thousand years <laughs> and after a while it gets to you that that's that mightn't be a bad uh, blueprint for the kind of society you have so you have a society that is a stewardship society not a competitive one not um not not one where certain people become millionaires billionaires that that would be against the law in aboriginal terms totally against the law for people and quite immoral to have that much money against people who are you know living on streets and so on and so on you know uh, and being forced to believe in this um other uh, another flawed system like democracy you know does democracy look after people living on the streets i'd love a research uh, i love a research project to go out and ask a whole lot of people who are living on the streets and in tents, what do you think about democracy? Do you think it's a good thing or do you think it'll save us and so on? I'd love to know what the answer they would give, you know, it'd be very interesting, I think. Um, so um, while, I, as I said, I don't know very much about um, uh, the, the technique, you know, technical kind of things of, of um, um, economics, but I know I know from my own um, cultural knowledge, uh, cultural uh, knowledge that I learned through my own, through my own mob and all all around the country is that you've got to first of all look after land, then that gives you the clue to looking after having a blueprint for looking after in the right way uh, the the kind of system that you have. Um, I might leave it there. Uh, there's many other things to um, to, to to talk about. Um, no, that's wonderful, Mary. Thank you. And yeah. we can certainly, you and I can have a chat. And as mm. questions come through, we can put them to you as well. So yes. um, for folks who don't know, Mary and I are collaborating on a book where we're exploring that these aspects of the relationist ethos as articulated by Mary um, and looking at what an Australian society could look like if some of these relationist ethos ideas were the foundation. So that will mm. be sort of the source of some of our discussions about what an economy could look like if it reflected mm. the relationist ethos. Mm. Um, and I'll just raise one point. There's a couple of good questions coming in too. So Mary, um, neither of us are economists and you know, I like the mm. fact that we always tell people that, but what we have discussed and what we are interested in is how we build a future society that is, as you said, um, fair, equitable, where people have a say over the kinds of things that they get up to. So if we were to pull apart the current economic system um, and have a look at some of the basic foundations of whether it's wealth distribution or mm. housing issues. Um, uh, I think the relationist ethos would have a little bit to say about many of those um, issues. Many of those things, so yes. One thing, I know you already touched on it, but did you want to talk a bit more about, you often use the Medicare system as an example of mm. this mm. obligation for each other mm. and the law of obligation or, you know, obligations and reciprocity in the system. Did you want mm. to talk a bit about why that sort of like notion of Medicare is so, so sits so well with the relationist ethos? Well, it's in relation to what I was talking about, the National Health Service, you know, um, uh, and apparently um, from what I know, uh, different bodies or different vested interests or certain politics, <laughs> politicians, uh, are trying to get rid of it in the UK. They want to bring in an American system where everybody's got to pay very well, very big for health care and doctors, the, the health industry, pharma, big pharma, they make billions, trillions of dollars out of the illness of of their own people it's a it's as far as i'm concerned it's un, uncivilized actually um so let's hope that uh, that's beaten back and that aboriginal uh sorry that australia doesn't doesn't ever go for any any kind of system like that um so a medicare system uh, and apparently a whole lot of western countries they do have a you know national health service of some sort um and uh i think so um yeah, sick care. That's a good comment somebody just made there. A sick care, not health care. Yes. Um, uh, sorry, um, I forgot what I was going to say now. I've distracted oh, yourself with another yes. good idea. I do that all the time. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, it's really, really important to, I don't know, um, people have awareness of these things, real awareness, uh, self-awareness, but, you know, countrywide awareness or state. Um, but the next important um, step is to have, make sure that there's enough capacity there to having had self-awareness, then have self-correction, um, uh, self 
how do you correct it? Do you know? Uh, do Western countries, they have that idea of self-correction? I don't think so. They have to work at it. But the, the, the really important thing is to build up the capacity for it. And building up the capacity for it can start with the environment. You, you look, look after that, look after uh, that. And that, the, the old idea is, even if Aboriginal people didn't know like the real science of science of things, of technical science of things, they knew that um, um, uh, things like empathy, say, it's a chemical in the brain, apparently. So they mightn't have known that, but they knew that you have to, to kind of use it or lose it kind of thing. You know, you have to work on it to have increased empathy. In other words, looking after land helps to increase or toughen up or grow a conscience. So you couldn't be cruel to people, you know, leave poor people uh, in their misery. You know, you couldn't, you, you just simply mustn't do that. And you mustn't have a government that does things like that either, you know. Um, so you have to really, really work very uh, long and hard to correct, you know. Another way of putting it, which is a weird way of putting it, I have to admit myself, I think of, um, and maybe it's completely wrong, <laughs> um, the, uh, what do you call a big ship, uh, a Titanic? Titanic went down because of, you know, um, hitting a reef. Oh, no, not a reef, uh, what do you call it? Um, iceberg. Uh, an iceberg, that's right, yeah, an iceberg. But uh, according to some historical sort of information, it could have been saved if they'd have had the right people um, in in um, uh, looking after it, looking after the well-being of, um, uh, sorry, looking after how to run it, really. Uh, there were brilliant captains and various high officers, but they left it in the hands of um, some lower officers, apparently, who didn't call out for help from a nearby ship. You know what I mean? In other words, they didn't have the right people running this enormous thing, you know, plus uh, some wrong things about it, like having a class system where the wealthy were in the best parts up the top and the very poor, poor, poor buggers in the, in the hulk. Uh, in the hold, do you know what I mean? Because that's all they could afford, or or something. So they were there. Um, so you an Aboriginal version of that that wouldn't have ha happened. You would have made sure that the absolutely the right people, and there's a a word for for that. Um, I use this Greek word. Um, there isn't an English equivalent of it. Uh, the opposite of hubris, you know. Wouldn't that be wonderful to have? Um, you know, something you can tackle hubris with. But the Greek word is uh, sophrosine, and it means how to be worthy of what is proper. How to be worthy of what is proper. It struck me straight away that that is exactly the old system that we had. It's changed quite a, quite a bit now. It's still there, but it's been upset, you know, turned upside down, really. Um, but you have those kinds of people running a country, running a society. So honourable, uh, uh, proper. That's a favourite word of Aboriginal people too, proper. Things must be done in a proper way. Mm. And not just uh, pragmatic, you know, it's a proper way to make, cook an omelette, you know, uh, but it's conceptual and it's principled also. You have to have those kind of people running things. That's extremely important for uh, um, economics and economy, especially a global economy, you know. Um, so, uh, but anyway, um, that's that's what would have happened. It wouldn't have, if it was an Aboriginal Titanic, it wouldn't have been a Titanic. <laughs> it wouldn't have sunk, you know. <laughs> you would have had the right people. So the society doesn't sink. So, you know, yeah, you, that have to have a, that, you know, you have to have a society where people have confidence in how it's run. Mm. I think that's more or less on its way out, you know on its way out and I had I'm not I'm not talking either or but I'm saying that there's too much of the wrong thing in the west you know what I mean so the other th the uh, other part of that and it has got to according to um um Michael Hudson too um the thing that started with large scale agriculture uh it it was wonderful. It's brilliant. There was a big fight apparently in the very early days of Neanderthals and so on. Um, the hunter gatherers uh, all over the world, this is hunter gatherers, um, foragers and that. Um, they had to try and uh, come to terms with this newfangled thing called farming, you know. <laughs> so the farmers and the foragers, they, they had a bit of a, you know, what's in it? There was a brilliant um, 
uh, documentary, English documentary about that whole, whole thing not long ago, actually. Um, so, but as we all know, farming, agriculture, won out. And then it grows, it becomes big and powerful and wealthy. Competition starts, of course, and so on. But what they're really, uh, what they were really arguing about is who will be the hegemonic ruler of a particular area in land. So all these empires fighting with each other, centuries go past, uh, the state has been uh, born, you know, created out of these empires. States start, you know, um, fighting with one another. They set sail out, out, mainly Europe, mainly Europe, all over the whole world take over, invade other countries and take their wealth and resources away from them. All that is still going on right today. That is what all these wars are about. The wars are really about auton uh, the um, hegemonic rules, ruler uh, has to uh, own completely and control all the resources in the world. Uh, um, and every different kind of resource you can think of, uh, including food, Food, of course, that's the most important thing, but uh, uh, technology, uh, but everything that grows and so on and so on. And that's what the real argument is about. Who will be the hegemonic ruler? You know? Thanks, Mary. And, uh, and I had to say it, but it's not Russia, you know? <laughs> you know, but that's your own personal opinion. I've got a few more good questions. Um, actually, we've got a lot and we'll see how we go for time, everyone. Um, Pamela has asked, can you speak a bit more about conflict resolution and the relationist Hi. ethos? Yeah. Well, to start off with, to, to start off with, um, so just leave it there. Just, huh. just leave it there. The joys of working from home, Mary. Uh, yes, yes, <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, sorry, what was I going to say? Uh, um, I've forgotten too. I've distracted myself. Um, a conflict, conflict resolution. Oh, conflict, yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, part of this um, achieving or running a running a um, uh, stable society, aiming for stability running for that um the idea arose over well developed over over thousands of years probably is how how not to have a war of conquest don't have wars of conquest but accept accept that humans uh uh have conflict built into them you, you can't stop humans it's one thing they do know and they do know a lot of insights into human nature aboriginal people they know that you, you're going to fight and argue because we have egos, we have egos, we have selfishness, we have all kinds of things that we can't help but um, fight with each other, you know. But uh, that can be handled in very good, very good, um, uh, managed, I should say, in very good ways of managing conflict, you know. They had these very, and they still go on today, but as you know, there's all sorts of problems to do with, um, what do you call it? Um, oh gee, dysfunctionalism in some communities, not everywhere, but some. But the 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 biggest winner, I believe, and how they figured things out, is not to have or, or wars of conquest. That is, there's plenty of words for conflict, all forms of conflict, all of it, but no word for invasion. Can you believe that? You know, there hasn't been found yet. It may still be out there, but it hasn't been found. Um, so no no one Aboriginal word for invade conquer and subjugate um no no word for that at all nothing um so so that's not the right thing to do is to go around um invading and bombing other people's country and taking their wealth you know that would never have happened if you if you get rid of that kind of economics you know the fight over over goods, over resources, and so on and so on, and um, hegemonic control, and so on. You won't have anything like that, you know. But anyway, yes. Yeah, Mary, and um, I, I know that you're a bit distracted because there's um, always distractions in our homes. But um, in terms of conflict resolution, I remember you telling me once um, that you know 
traditional societies particularly had very strong protocols and rules for mm. how to behave and what to do and even who not to talk to. And I, I oh, yeah. you know, the mother and was it the mother-in-law rule? One of the yes. reasons they prevented sons, from, you know, husbands from talking to their mothers-in-law was to mm. prevent known conflict. So this wisdom yes. of how people yeah. get along, it might seem almost strange to modern progressive societies that we'd have strict rules, but um, mm. Did you? Yes. I don't know. I just thought that was no. Just, just that that it's probably not now, but it still is in some places. You know, you you can talk um, via someone else. You via someone else if you man talks with his mother-in-law or her to him. And apparently, my um, my old parents, their um, uh, that rule was in place, and uh, he had the greatest respect for his mother-in-law, mum's mother. You know, great respect. Um, but you you follow that you know and it, it 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 you might think it's wise but it's actually I prefer to call it just common sense it's sound psychology very sound do you know what I mean it's um that's how the so because the 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 individual isn't a king in Aboriginal society it's no idea that the individual comes before everything and everybody else you know what I mean it's not uh, that's why we're autonomous but autonomous regard has to come with it so you have to look at it like in 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 that way um but yes very clever uh, uh ways of having an argument settling arguments they even had places like that you could fight that's a fighting place over there some particular area cleared ground so uh plus things like um people who are just arguing say arguing arguing um and uh, it gets more hotter and hotter and then finally, someone will say, uh, you know, other people who are trying to keep the peace and calm things down, but then sometimes it, it's like boiling water. It'll get to a certain stage, and someone, oh well, let them let them go then. They don't want to. They don't want to have. They don't want to make up. They don't want to have peace. They don't. You know. They want to fight. Let them go then. And that's all minded. It's minded. Do you mm, know what I mean mm. by observers and other people? But right. when you have alcohol involved, that's it. That's the end of those old rules. Yeah. And that's why alcohol has been so unbelievably dangerous and destructive of ours. We we would never have invented something like alcohol, nothing at all, because it frees the individual. The individual can be a, you know, a bossy figure. You mm. know. Mm. No, and I've, I've, I find it fascinating someone who's been born and raised in the western tradition where everything from hollywood movies to you know popular culture keeps telling us we can be anything we want to be it's all up to the mm. individual and the loneliness mm. that sort of comes with some of those mindsets mm, I, the, more I, the more i read about um the relationist ethos in um mm. in aboriginal culture and in cultures all around the world um this notion that Yes, you are an individual, but your belonging and your purpose and your sense of being is formed mm. and forged through your relationship with others in the community. So, mm, mm, mm. and in fact, there's a great question um, someone has asked, you know, what does autonomy or autonomous regard look like in a relationist economy? Um, mm. And I don't know if you've yeah. really touched on it, but. Well, um, well, that would be a good thing for people to um, think of themselves what do you what do you think if you if you have to be uh, autonomous regard uh, you you're attending to it you're you're doing it you know and you're in the middle of a um, uh, economy a co an economy where um, you know profits and profit making um, is extremely important um, I don't know perhaps for example uh, <laughs> um, uh, it's not really a proper uh, example. Uh, but an old example, uh, a cousin uh, who died now, she was married to, uh, and it's not to do with him being Scottish or anything, but he was Scottish. <laughs> he was a butcher. <laughs> not, I'm not saying anything. No, no not not good. Um, but uh, he was known for not, uh, don't give people, um, you can, on tick, you can get things on tick. He wouldn't allow that. This is way back in the 50s, you know. And uh, but he's married to an Aboriginal girl, you see, so he has to he has to forget about that. You have obligations you to your relatives, <laughs> yeah, so he has to, you know, he had to. He didn't. And, and, he and he wasn't was, very fond of it, but he did it. You know, <laughs> I love that. So his his cultural idea of not not getting yes. into debt, uh, letting others get into debt with him was he had to share a bit more. Yeah, um, <laughs> I mean, he that, might have learned that. You see, and I'm talking about him as an individual, not as yeah. uh, well. All Scottish people are like this or something. I'm not saying that. 
he, he no. was just like that, you know. He wanted to do a good business. Yeah. I'm thinking with the work we've done inside the new economy where people have looked across, you know, the mm. role of workers in a capitalist system um, and workers' co-ops as an antidote where people have more control over their work and a say over their decisions, I would imagine that, that would reflect an autonomous regard, the idea that mm. we might be working on something but mm. you can't treat your workers terribly. Um, and Absolutely in fact, not. Yeah, why don't you question mm. the very roots of how these systems, the governance works, mm. where mm. one person thinks they're better than everyone else because they've got the capital or something. So, mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, you can't you can't treat your staff badly. You have to treat them. Um, I know my father was a, a foreman, you know, a foreman, so he had his group, his team and so on, you know, um, there. Um, uh, but the way he treated them, he treated them very much, not, nothing like a boss very much equal and balanced and all that kind of stuff. They had great response. And now I know a lot of people are like that, you know, Aboriginal, uh, non-Aboriginal people that can be like that, but a whole society that has that kind of system, mm. you know, that's a stable society, that stable. And, you know, you won't end up with uh, competitiveness and so on and so on like that. Now we mm. talk about this a lot in AILA too. There's obviously there are millions of Australians who have a remarkable love of country mm. and place mm. and a land ethic. But as a lawyer who critiques the legal system that props up the economy, we mm. can say vehemently that the Australian legal system, the institutions, the system itself has no land ethic. You know, mm. country no. does not come first. That's not mm. just obvious from practice. It's obvious from mm. the principles uh, in the legal system. So so what Mary mm. is talking about, what I find fascinating to think about is what if the entire culture had certain views that meant, you know, caring for countries yes. was at the heart of things. At oh, the heart I, of things, yeah. I find that fascinating. Yeah. Another well, great question. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry, go on. Oh, no. uh, well, um, well, what I was going to say was um, I know um, – uh, oh, sorry. Um, the idea of um, oh, a citizen, say. Yep. Um, trying to think through this for future, maybe future changes, who knows, uh, uh, especially in political theory or political practice, I should say. Uh, so everyone's a, a citizen, but what if uh, a stewardship and citizenship were kind of joined together? Do you know what I mean? In the future, over that? So, but but also that governments, the state agrees and works in with this kind of system and helps this system too. Now that would be a big change. That would be a major, major change. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily, when, when I'm talking about this stuff, I'm not talking about it as in uh, trying to be like uh, proselytize, <laughs> convert people like, a, like it's a religion or something. Um, but, um, no, it's it's all to do with, you know, it's not about being good and virtuous uh, because there's no heaven to go to later on, you know. There's nothing. You won't be rewarded later. It is its own reward in a, uh, um, um, a stable society. That's that's why you could do it, you know. So it's common sense. It's, um, it's um, the way, just the way of doing it. Um, oh, what's that other word? Um, well, it's a concept, you know, it could be a concept, it's pragmatic, and it just allows for more um, people getting on with each other, do you know? Mm -hmm. Not so much um, uh, comp co violent competition, no, that's that would be out of the out of the picture. Sorry, there was a question. No, I was going to say, speaking of violent competition, um, Rod's got a great question. Um, mm -hmm. He said... Uh, I heard you say, and he says, I think I'm paraphrasing, that greed is a normal human construct and it takes mm. conscious effort to share. Mm. Can you expand on this, please? Um, mm. And perhaps you could talk about this notion of how empathy yes. is not seen as a deep value, something that had to be nurtured mm. as well mm. as, which is kind of often the opposite of greed, which is caring. Yes, yes yeah. Well, it, it goes back to not having uh, the idea of stewardship as a religion don't have a, you, they're not they're not worshiping the um uh nature they're not nature worshipers you know the idea of looking after something outside of the self outside you're not looking to be saved salvation uh you're not listening to some voice in the sky or in your head or even a great teacher a wonderful teacher a guru a wise old grandfather or something like that um it's all for the self but you've got to get right you could say it's a bit like transcendental 
but not fully. But you have to look after something outside yourself. The only thing you look after really is the thing you're walking on. So the lo- the more you do that, it becomes embedded. And that's that's where your conscience is strengthened. Your conscience is strengthened really firmly. So you're, you're not only being empathetic via autonomous regard, you're looking after something permanently all your life, you know. This is what the meaning of life is and so on. Um, you, you're doing that, and that makes sure that you have a, a strong conscience, a very strong. You could not um, do really, really inhuman things um, because that would mean your your conscience is a bit damaged, you know. Uh, so it's very good for um, – uh, a, I, I call our system uh, not a civilizational state, it's a civilizational culture. So they really, really hammered home these ideas about how you could have, you're not, you're not trying to make good people. It's, it's one of the hardest things to do. You can lecture, you can um, lecture, rant at them, read all the right things, listen to wise things, and so on and so on. But you have to do ethics. You have to do this ethics is a doing thing it's not just a high ideal that you aim for and you believe in it's not something to believe in you have to actually literally do it then it gets embedded internalized and you can't help it you can't help but uh, do this and i know this for a fact having worked in a organization child care um and this is and i know again now other cultures do this too but uh, if your relatives come and it's a big family <laughs> you can't say no you can't turn them away. You take them in because you're obliged to, you know. Um, and they they might, they you like your relatives. You may or may not like your relatives, but you're obliged to look after them, you know. And so, uh, and that's this this idea, um, without the science about it, but of growing a, a, your conscience, you see. You can't, you can't be, um, or ignore them and say, oh, look, sorry, no room at the inn, you know. <laughs> You go away and look you for bugger off. It's, it's yeah, bugger off. yeah. Look, there's a there's a drop in place down the road. There you go. There, you know, <laughs> you just simply couldn't do that to your relatives. You know, you're obliged. Thanks, Mary. Yeah. Um, the, uh, we've probably got time for this. Maybe this one last question. There might be time for another one. But um, yeah. I love this question. Um, how how would the Aboriginal ethic deal with a group who wants more than their share, e.g., our global billionaire class? Oh, God, yes. Well, um, for a start, it, it probably wouldn't happen. <laughs> um, although there are a couple of millionaires now, you know, uh, one or two who's in a business, they've done very well. But um, but even there, it wouldn't be seen in a, um, wouldn't be seen in, in a, as an evil kind of thing. You know, even quite often if uh, some bad fella, a black fella, uh, ro- robs the till, you know, um, uh, takes off. Quite often, even that, um, he, again, this is this internalized f- f- uh, sense. You you immediately go and you share it with somebody else. Actually, you don't head for South America, you know, and t- hide out, you know, in some mountain, mountain or something. You don't. You go immediately to other people and they are, may, or, may or may not know, quite often ha- don't know uh, where he's got money from or something like that. So someone who's made really good in the, that economic sense probably w- simply wouldn't wouldn't happen um, uh, doing it on their own. Do you know what I mean? And being uh, just living the good life, and while all around is just living an ordinary Aboriginal life. You know what I mean? You'd be obliged first of all to do something useful with it, um, and they'd probably get stuck into you for it. You know, not rob you. But uh, expect well. What are you going? You're going to be do just be a useless bugger, are you? You know, and just keep making money. You know, mm. you can't do that without helping other people. You know, and You'd I think be told in no uncertain terms. Actually, you you yes. would be if you were game enough to still live in the community. You know, mm. and having around. <laughs> From what you've said um, in other conversations, and this is one of my favourite, just the line that is stuck in my brain. I know I mention it all the time. Um, and it comes back to the question about how did you manage, how do people manage greed? It This line is mm. ego was managed like a volatile substance. Um, mm. 
that you oh, yes. and it's kind of it's like it's so inbuilt into the system that you mm. shouldn't need to be egotistical or greedy that I guess mm. the conditions for becoming a standalone millionaire or billionaire wouldn't mm. have been, wouldn't have been in place mm. that would have been seen as not of not the proper way to not, progress yeah, not proper yeah not proper there's an old saying I think did I say it before I'm not quite sure um, I don't know. Uh, the I was looking for the opposite word in English on Google uh, for um, God for corruption for corrupt for corruption. No, oh. uh, what do you call it now? Oh. oh, God, isn't it awful? You know it as well as I do. It always comes up with certain politicians. <laughs> um, Are we looking at integrity, honesty? No, no, the opposite. What's the what's the what's the crooked police? The crooked uh, corruption politician or corrupt? Corruption. Um, oh God, it starts with C too. Um, oh, it's a negative quality. Oh, it's a negative quality. Very negative. But anyway, I was looking for the opposite of that. Uh, <laughs> and apparently, well, according to Google, I don't know. Um, but there's there's no one word, one English word, opposite of it. Um, uh, but there is one in Greek. <laughs> the original word, that word, the bad word, um, is a Greek word too. Uh, but the uh, opposite of it is um, Greek, uh, sophrosine, it's called. Sophrosine. Oh, right, you did say that, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've never and heard soph- that word. No, I've never heard it either. Well, it's Greek, you know, it's uh, maybe even old mm. Greek. But what it actually means is how to be worthy of what is proper. Mm. And I thought, how funny! That word "proper" is very popular with Aboriginal people. Yeah. You you must know to do things in a proper way, not just as I said, you know, making an omelette. You know, so it's a pragmatic, pragmatic, practical, um, principled, and um, conceptual too. Mm. But you have to have people who run things, who run societies, who know that how to be worthy of what's proper. And of course, that's the last thing. Quite often, yeah, you, you don't. Hey, um, yeah. Uh, a JFK, you know, you'd have a JFK, someone like that who'd know something like that, you know. Um, maybe, you know, I don't know for sure, but you know, from what, what I gather. Yeah. Um, oh, what is it? Well, just you know, you know it is. It's very popular. A oh, very popular word. Very popular. Corruption is very popular. Well, um, corruption is very popular. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but that uh, going back to this thing of having the right people running things. You know, um, I, I I still, I don't know if people would agree with this, but I think more and more people are agreeing with it, is that government is a little bit too close to um, big, wealthy corporations. They're almost like a servant of corporations, especially the extractive industries anyway. And uh, knowing all the facts they know, they still continue to do that. So it's a very strange relationship, isn't it? Uh, you you definitely not... Um, not definitely not proper. <laughs> yes, definitely not proper. The mm. proper way. Um, there's one more question that I think we have time for. Um, Claire has. I'll just shorten your question, Claire. Forgive me, and I hope I get mm. it right. She's curious about your advice about how to. I think it's about really how to understand different Indigenous perspectives. She's got um, curious to your advice about incorporating Indigenous perspectives into scholarship, thinking, work, without treating people. Um, I don't know. I think it's about how you can respect individual or different mm. language groups, views and opinions, and not just having some universal uh, mm. stuff. Sorry, mm. I didn't really paraphrase that very well at all. <laughs> um, different. Um, I'm, I'm really always been very wary of uh, trying to turn this into um, like converting, like some kind of religious or religiosity, you know, um, don't, don't have it like that. I, I'm a great believer in say, um, in schools, they they should learn. All all schools, private and state, should have subjects like philosophy, uh, and to look after the environment. All all through grade school, high school, they should have that, and not in a religious way. In when I was going to. Uh, primary school, they had uh, religious classes, you know, this Church of England could go here and <laughs> Catholics there. And <laughs> this is a state school in Southport here. Um, but don't. Um, so it's a doing thing, though, too. It's an enjoyable doing thing for 
kids. So they're not just there being lectured to, talked to. They go out and they learn about everything and have the science, you know, the science about um, all that, but also have the Aboriginal cultural uh, ideas there too. And they're learning all this in schools. That would be a, a brilliant thing, I think, um, just to have philosophy anyway. Um, I think I think that's what needs to happen in Aboriginal education. Uh, sorry, general education. It really would, you know. Um, so so I wouldn't I wouldn't try and um, uh, try and be um, what do you call it um, a strict or narrow thinking. You must you must do this. You know you must learn this and so on. It's all done very very nicely and persuasively and so on. You know and. It's fun and it's a good thing to look after land, isn't it? You know, and so on and so on. Yeah. And that's how it's taught. It's actually proper old way of being you being yeah. taught that. So Well, and in yeah. your culture it would have been taught day by day, little increments until you mm. were about fifteen and you understood mm. so much more mm. because everyone was teaching you how to care for yeah. country. Well, and you're surrounded about... by people, see, who are doing yeah. the same thing. Mm. Yeah. It's culture, isn't it? It's like what yes, you that's right, yeah. And those you, um, norms. Yeah. yeah. You go out crabbing or fishing, you bring back um fair amount. Oh well, share it with various cousins and so on, you know. The mm -hmm. neighbour, the white neighbour also, you know, gets his share and all that. Yeah. Mm. And I was just gonna say, um, back to Claire's question too, as a non indigenous person who works occasionally I write, um, if you're looking at being respectful in trying to attribute or cite or reference other uh, cultures or peoples, it's always best to go to just other Indigenous writers, thinkers, and just mm. cite their material. Um, mm. This map, I did not see this map until I was in my early 20s, which I, to this day, find pretty hor horrific as a, a, a allegedly mm. educated young lawyer. Um, this map now, lots of people can understand that Aboriginal people weren't um, yeah. monolithic. They weren't one group. So my only advice to you as another non-Indigenous person journeying in this country um, and trying to be a good earthling and a good citizen is just pay respect to whoever you're reading and look for the writing. There's so much mm. work by uh, Aboriginal and other Indigenous writers, thinkers, speakers, just reference them and start mm. to understand how, how you know, where everyone is and how we all fit together. So. Mm. And and I, can I just say once more, please read, I know he's Marxist, but um, you read uh, Michael Hudson. Honestly, it's the best, to me, it's the best uh, um, um, economist because he refers to ancient societies, you see. To, yep. That's yep. the main thing that I like about him. Anyway, yep. I have to say goodbye. You do have so, to leave. Sorry. Thank you, Mary. Sorry. Thank you, everyone. Sorry. No, no, Thank don't you. say sorry. It's been a wonderful sorry. hour. We'll see you again soon. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, love. Thanks, love. Thank you, everybody. Um, and if you have more questions for Mary, um, please come along to the conference or join us um, in one of our various online workshops in the future. So thank you, everybody. We'll see you soon. Bye.